Welcome to the History of North America. I'm Mark Vinette. Our narrative takes us to Florida and the arrival of French Protestant Huguenot colonists in 1564. French Huguenots made two attempts to establish a haven in North America. In 1562, naval officer Jean Ribot led an expedition that explored Florida and the present-day southeastern USA and founded the outpost of Charles Fort on Paris Island, South Carolina. The French wars of religion precluded a return voyage, and the outpost was abandoned. In 1564, Ribot's former lieutenant, René Goulin de Laudonnière, launched a second voyage to build a colony. He established Fort Caroline in what is now Jacksonville, Florida. Eric Yanis of the Other States of America podcast has graciously agreed to share his telling of this incredible story. Welcome back to the tale of French Florida. The Huguenots, who were French Protestants, mostly Calvinists, were swelling in numbers in France. But at the same time, that brought down authorities upon them as they grew to be a larger and larger threat to the existing power structure. Because of this, the Huguenots, sensing a series of civil wars just on the horizon, were looking for ways to fit inside of the French Empire and be useful to those powers that be, and yet be slightly outside of their grasp. In a sense, they were looking for safety. Some of them anonymity, and for many, a fresh start. That brought Admiral Gaspard de Coligny into our story. Admiral of the French Navy, he was perhaps the most powerful Huguenot in all of France. It was under his command that these Huguenot colonies would be planted in territories the Spanish otherwise considered theirs. Hence why the French now end up in Florida. Now the attitude of the French was, hey, we landed on North America too. Maybe Florida is part of New France. The Spanish had yet to create any permanent settlements there. The natives seemed openly hostile to the Spanish, and there really was no Verrazano Sea in the middle of North America, nicely separating New Spain from New France. So maybe New France just rolled straight through the rest of the continent to all parts south. Coligny, being too high ranked, too much of a noble to go out and do any of the work himself, had lesser nobles under him found these colonies. The one we focused on was Charles Fort. Now, the people he put in charge of that were Jean Robot, a lesser noble who was a decorated Navy man, tons of experience, and just under him, René Laudonner, an even lesser noble with less experience, less decoration. These men originally planned to explore the coastline of what was Spanish Florida, which at this time was much larger than what you would think of as the American state of Florida today. It was probably much of the Southeast. This first party of exploration found the area so pleasant. Of course, they were there in the spring. They found the area so pleasant, they said, let's just start building the fort now. They built the fort, Charles Fort, and then the noblemen went back home for resupply. Now, they didn't plan on making this fort, so they didn't bring provisions. They didn't bring seeds, farming implements, nothing like that. They didn't bring women. They didn't bring children, except for a few cabin boys. This was not meant to be a colony. It was an accidental colony built on enthusiasm. And enthusiasm can fill the heart, but it can't fill the stomach. And the men at Charles Fort, having lost favor with the natives who provided them food, began to starve. Tempers grew. There was a mutiny. They slew their leader. And without resupply, which should have come after months and months of waiting, they decide to make a makeshift ship out of moss and planks and their clothing and their bedsheets and find their way back to France somehow. They had good winds, then the winds died down, the food ran out, the water ran out, they resorted to cannibalism, and that just limped them along the coast of Europe, where they were saved by some English sailors who found them so decrepit, so run down, that they were resigned to lay down and die. And where were our noblemen? Why did they not resupply the fledgling small fort? Well, it turns out our first French Civil War of Religion broke out. Coligny rallying his forces, employing Rabot and Laudonnaire, as the Huguenots, in cities where they were large enough in number, created committees for their own safety and took over small areas, essentially creating city-states, fighting a war against the fervent Catholics who chose to battle them. Rabot, on the losing end of one of these city-states, end up escaping to England. And while in England, under Elizabeth I, he tries to swindle her out of a fleet to go resupply Charles Fort. 
but she got wise to this and locked him in the Tower of London. With the first war of religion over, Admiral Gaspar de Caligny would now have time to work on his passion projects, a French Florida. But his top dog, Jean Rabot, is still locked in the Tower of London. He will have to depend on the less experienced, less talented, and far less noble René Laudonnaire. A risky proposition, but we're now in the year 1564. And who dies in the year 1564? John Calvin, the founder of Calvinism. The man who breathed new life into Protestantism in general was at its lowest ebb before John Calvin came onto the scene. Now Calvin is gone. The Huguenots are leaderless. And the Protestant cause looks dimmer than ever. But the Huguenots were hardy, if not desperate, and there were volunteers to be found for this second escapade into Florida. Actually, four guys from the first expedition that ended so terribly agreed to go on to the second. And so they actually had guides and a little bit of experience. This time they brought a few women. They had mostly Huguenots, but some Catholics, some people they labeled infidels, which probably also included African slaves. So there were some African slaves on board. They took three ships, about 300 colonists total. And we're going to get most of our information from three dudes that left accounts. René de Laudonnaire, we talked about, we have his account. A artist named Jacques Lemoyne, who is now famous for his very early depictions of Native Americans in very flattering ways, very human ways. And an old carpenter named Nick Lachelot also left us an account. So those three men are going to paint the picture of the second attempt to settle Florida by the French, centered around their fort, Fort Caroline. When the French landed right before summer in the year 1564, their reaction to the beauty of this land was very similar to the last expedition. Lachelot the carpenter wrote, Florida promised an abundance of all that man might desire in the world, for that country had received a singular favor from heaven. Another account of this same experience came from a young man writing home to his father. And in this letter, he refers to Florida multiple times as part of New France. Clearly in the mind of these French colonists, Florida was now within the domain of the French Empire and no longer in the domain of the Spanish. We'll come to find out the Spanish believed the exact opposite. And the natives took neither opinion and believed that they were possessors of the land. And now let's consider our artist, Lemoyne, and the things he would begin seeing. As a visual artist, as a painter, everything in Florida would be utterly foreign to his experience. And beyond the landscapes and the water and the plants and the animals, he was most interested in the natives. He describes coming to one of these white marble pillars that the French planted previously to denote French possession. And what he saw around it were a large group of natives dancing and singing and throwing flowers upon the marble column. From Lemoyne's eyes, they were worshipping the column. What they were actually doing, from this young man's eyes, they found the column to be some sort of miraculous stone. At the column, or in the nearby village, Laudaner was showered with gifts, and he, in return, showered the natives with gifts. He understood the gift-giving culture, which hints that his previous interactions with natives were a little more involved than the surviving sources paint a picture of. Everything in this village, while it might seem ordinary to us today, because we have these histories, was utterly foreign. They have an abundance of a certain seed which grows seven feet high. The stalk is thick like a cane and the grain is as large as peas. The ear is a foot long, the color of natural wax. He's talking about corn, he's talking about maize, which to him may as well have been a crop cultivated on the moon. He had no easy way to describe this crop. He had to refer to peas and wax. Go figure. In the United States, there are several Huguenot worship groups and societies. The Huguenot Society of America has headquarters in New York City and has a broad national membership. One of the most active Huguenot groups is in Charleston, South Carolina. While many American Huguenot groups worship in borrowed churches, the congregation in Charleston has its own church. Although services are conducted largely in English, every year the church holds an annual French service, which is conducted entirely in French. Typically, the annual French service takes place on the first or second Sunday after Easter in commemoration of the signing of the 1598 Edict of Nantes, which granted the Calvinist Huguenot Protestants of France substantial rights in the Catholic nation. 
Next time, we continue the saga of 16th century Protestant settlements in the territory of Florida. I'm Mark Vinette, and I hope you're enjoying the ride. <laughs>